Today, we start by talking about the beginning of a new school year and technology we plan to use for this fall semester 2018. Hello and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 19, this day, uh, August 23rd, 2018. Hello, my name is Benjamin Stewart, calling from beautiful Aguas Calientes, Mexico. Morning, everybody. This is Piri Herrera, also here in Aguas Calientes, and uh, welcoming you again to one more, uh, another episode for Teacher Learning Cast, where we like to talk and talk and talk and discuss about anything that comes to our mind related to teaching, especially language teaching. Uh, I want to welcome everybody that is following in the different media, in Facebook, in YouTube, in our websites, and um, ready to begin a new semester here in Aguascalientes, a new school year also, new classes, first day all around, first week all around town. Absolutely. Ben, how are you today? Excellent, PD. Uh, happy to uh, have, have, share this this week and this discussion with you, especially as we get going, starting uh, actually our third week of classes. We've had uh, two weeks of class so far and uh, getting to know the students. It's always exciting to begin a new year, starting with some new faces. And um, uh, today we're going to have an opportunity really to talk about some ideas that we're kind of floating around to see how we start uh, the new year. How do we uh, get uh, acclimated with the new year, getting to know our students, and uh, starting a new new classes with them. But before we jump into that, uh, we want to welcome you, those of you who are watching the live broadcast. This is a weekly broadcast for teachers, teachers to connect who are interested in per, uh, professional development, those who like to share experiences. There's a lot of opportunities for you to be able to do that. If you wish, you may join us in our Facebook page where you can leave comments. You can leave comments during the show. Uh, Pity is uh, fielding questions from our Facebook page at Teacher Learning Cast. And I'm also fielding questions if you're joining us in our YouTube broadcast. Uh, we'll be uh, fielding questions there as well. So if you're watching us live, feel free to post your questions, your experiences, uh, because really this is what this weekly podcast is all about, finding teachers who like to connect and share experiences. And uh, of course, we're always looking for teachers to join us in our live broadcast. So if you have something to share, something that we've talked about in the past or something that uh, we are still uh, have yet to discuss, you can also join us. We're always looking for teachers. We've had some wonderful uh, educators who have joined us in live broadcasts in the past who have shared their experiences. So those have been always uh, welcomed, and uh, we always learn a lot in those experiences. Yeah, so I want to greet the people that is joining on Facebook, Hillary, Veronica, Daniel, and Carmen, Chito, uh, Hector. Uh, nice that you join us for a while. We'll be discussing about, as I just said, I'm, I'm, Ben and I will said, we'll be discussing about the new semester. So uh, we want to share some ideas and, and some uh, maybe tips or, or things that have been working for us at the beginning of the semester, because it is always something that, um, uh, in my from from my end, it's it's something exciting. That's why I like this profession. Every semester, it, there's something different. You got new students, you got a, a, a new term, you got uh, reformas educativas, you got changes in the programs, you get uh, new bosses, you got er every different people around that comes. And uh, it, this semester we got exchange students in our rooms, so it's 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 a whole new world if you can view it like that. You may got some things to be repeated, but there are new things to happen. What do you think about that, Ben? Having a new semester coming? Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know we've had a lot of discussions with technology, and I think today we'll have an opportunity to also talk a little bit of tech. Uh, about how we get started and 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 how we plan through the semester, but uh, it's always it is always exciting because uh, you know I I tend to teach some of the same classes each sem semester, but 
uh, with a new group. Every group is completely different. It's a completely learning, different learning experience. So it's always uh, great to uh, begin uh, a new semester and a new year, especially this year. Um, I've had I have the pleasure of uh, teaching a prope group, which is a, uh, a first year uh, year well a few first year set of courses for uh, those students who are interested in entering into the BA. So they'll take courses in uh, the four skills and, and grammar, and uh, so it's always good to see some fresh faces in the BA uh, as well as uh, advanced level study courses with uh, students that may have, maybe I've seen kind of uh, in the hall, but now uh, have the pleasure of having in class. So definitely uh, great to begin a new year. Yes, and uh, and, and after hard work, because uh, I suppose most of the teachers start preparing for the, for the year or the semester uh, before the first day of class, right? We start like somehow planning, having meetings. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, a, a, a crews that get together, that gather to share, to, to plan, to review programs, to see what comes. In, in the national program, we have consejos técnicos in which they also get together and they start working way before. The teacher himself is preparing for the new group when they know which year, which semester, which classes they are teaching, they start to get set. And, um, and then you start preparing material, you start preparing ideas for what you're going to do during the semester with the new group uh, and, uh, and the newcomers. Sometimes we have groups that already know each other with newcomers inside. So all of this starts to, 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 to work in teacher's mind days, weeks, and sometimes months before the beginning of the semester. Sometimes when you are ending a cycle, you are already preparing for the next one when you have uh, some consecutive classes or things like those or evaluating your technology or the things you did. And so the question in here, after all this hard work, I know uh, most teachers do this and, and like really to get involved into this planning. But the question that I want to start with today is what do you do uh, the first day of class? How do you start your first day of class? What are uh, this question would go beyond like thinking about what are the aspects that you think in the first day of class are going to uh, have an impact on your group and not only in the group, but in the classes themselves and yourself, your own dynamic for the class. So, Ben, what do you do the first day of class? Yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show a little bit of how I start. Um, and I'd like to just uh, expand to that question and also introduce another one that's very similar, but how do you get to know your learners? And, right. and I think one of the things that um, I tend to do, uh, because you know it's hard, especially if you've never had the, the students in class before, you want to get to know your students as soon as possible, obviously. And uh, one of the ways that I try to do that, and I'll go ahead and share my screen now, Good. I, I just want to stress what you said, because that's one of the aspects I have as a suggestion. Uh, uh, get to know your students ASAP. All right. So that's that, that you, you kind of nail one of the key aspects in here. Go on. Please. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it's important to really ask at the pity's question, what do you do that first day? Because that first day really is important. It really is essential. It's not a throwaway day. It's really that first contact that you have with your students within the context of your course and you want to take full advantage of it uh, as much as possible. So I think that first day is critical. Um, I would also add though that getting to you know, know your students is a process and you know I, I think we can all relate that we get to know our students more and more each day and uh, it's kind of a, an ongoing thing, right? But uh, definitely as much as we can learn from our students and find out what they're expectations are and their past experiences, uh, I think the better. And to that end, that's one of the, these are the a couple of concepts that I want to share with you is how to find out what their expectations are for the course and to learn a little bit about their past experiences in order for you to have a, a better understanding of who your students are and how you can best uh, provide assistance for that particular course. 
So I'm sharing my screen here, and I want to show you a couple of classes because there um, I've got two writing classes this semester. Uh, again, uh, Petey and I teach in a, a BA program in English language teaching, and um, I tend to teach writing courses. So I'm going to speak from that perspective, uh, primarily a skills-driven course, specifically in writing. And uh, the first course that I'm sharing with you here is called Writing One, and this is a prope, a first semester uh, writing course for students who are typically at an A2 English uh, language proficiency level. And so they are just beginning the writing process uh, in many cases. And uh, the, the general goal for this particular course, Writing One, is to develop a paragraph. So we're, we're not looking at essays at this point. We're basically just looking at paragraph development. But one of the first things that we uh, that I like to do with this course, and it will be very similar to the other course I'll share with you in a few minutes, is uh, finding out what their expectations are for the course. And so one of the things that I do is that I ask them a set of questions um, getting started about what their expectations are because I also also like to articulate my expectations uh, for the course what do I what I expect from from them but I I feel that it's necessary for me anyway to hear from them first to give them an opportunity to first share their experiences and then based on what they tell me uh, then I will uh, kind of introduce my expectations so that we can reach some sort of negotiation at the, at the beginning of the course, or at least a level of understanding really about how, uh, how we uh, see the course. So the prompt here that I use for getting started uh, for this particular course is that I ask them to create a 150 to 200 word uh, reflection of their expectations. And I ask them to share what they expect from me as uh, you know, specific as possible. What would you like to know in order to help? Uh, what would you like me to know about you in order for me to help you for this course? Um, and really for them to have an opportunity to share some of their experiences. And I really do the same activity for my composition course, which is a third semester course. These are English language learners at uh, about a B1, B1 to B2 level. And uh, I want to share with you just a, a few responses because they're fairly insightful. Uh, if you really look at, um, you know, uh, what kind of insight that they provide in some of their expectations. I have a few responses here, and I'm not sure if you can see this because it's a, a little bit small. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can, yeah. Okay. Maybe not in Facebook. Um, you get to the official link, click above, and you can actually read. Okay, great, cool. Um, so, yeah, so I'm not going to go through all of these, but some of these uh, responses I think are very helpful. Um, and, you know, some of the students mentioned that they want to learn techniques, they want to learn strategies for throughout the course, they want me to be patient with them, uh, and it's really good for them to externalize these expectations, right? Because maybe they have not been asked what their expectations uh, are for a course. I've had students who've come to me and said, this is the first time any teachers ask for what I expect out of the course. And so I, I'm hoping that by giving them this opportunity to share these responses, um, it feel they feel that they are, they have a little bit more authority in their own learning, or they have a little bit more autonomy at, and voice really uh, to express you know what it is that they want out of out of the course, and so you know getting started. Although I I may not know the students, and it does take time to to know your students, of course. I use this exercise to not only go over these at the beginning, and this is what I do when they give me all of this information. I summarize. I synthesize all the information. And then I throw it, I create a list, and then I share this list back to them so that they know that I have included in this list for me all of their expectations. And I always ask them if there are some expectations that I missed that they, right. that they you know, tell me. But I make sure that they know that I know what their expectations are for the course. And then 
throughout the course, as I begin to learn more about each student, I will frequently go back to this list of expectations for each student, and it helps frame kind of where they're at, where as I learn their personalities and their strengths and weaknesses, and I, I go back to this list of expectations, it really is insightful for me. It helps me a lot to gain perspective for really trying to find that, that optimal way of helping uh, the students. Yes, um, Ben, I think uh, you got exactly to some of the aspects you were mentioning along, some of the aspects I've got, like some recommendations for the beginning of uh, the semester. And in the very first day of class, yes, it's a key to start knowing your students, to make them feel uh, that you are taking into consideration their, their expectations. I would go a little bit before that stage. As, the, as part of knowing your learners, as part of a diagnosis, I would go a little bit before. Uh, there are things that, uh, that we should always uh, be careful as a recommendation, in, in my opinion, like simple and small details, like starting with um, knowing their names, like making them feel that you are actually interested in knowing who they are before even asking anything. One of the aspects I manage with my teaching, uh, with my students, that the teachers that are in development, is uh, when they have a situation with the students along the semester or since the very beginning, when they have certain kind of request for them to do, even the classes themselves, homeworks or whatever they want to do, when they want to deal with a, a situation, an issue, somebody that is not working along, somebody that has a certain attitude and you want to have certain talk with the students, the first thing I recommend is gain the right to ask students. Gain the right to um, get this connection somehow. And one of the questions I ask my students is, how often do you see this student and how often do you even greet the student? How do you even, how often do you stop to, to have a conversation, a casual, normal conversation in which this student realizes you are a human being, not just a teacher, and you make a connection? That, in the sense of the first day of class, I think it's essential to set the situation in which the students realize we are equals, we are all humans. Yes, they are students. Yes, we are the teachers, we, but we have to gain the right. How much can they really tell you if they uh, do not really know you? How much can they open? I try to make certain um, activities like um, interactional activities to start seeing their reactions, to start realizing how they really act in, from, in front of others. I happen to have a first semester this year, and some of them know each other, most of them, but uh, like 10 students are newcomers, uh, and greetings for them. I think some of, some of them are watching us right now in Facebook Live. And, um, and it's important to, re to, to see uh, what's going on with them. How do they react to these situations? And all of them, the, new, the, the group is new uh, in the sense of they don't know me as a teacher. They haven't seen me in front of them. So the first thing I do is to start sensing exactly how they feel me at the beginning. How much can I ask? How far can I get that day with them? How much confidence can we establish? How, how much can they tell me? And, and, one, uh, and that, uh, well, the, the specifics about it would be start with, start with the basics. Uh, start knowing them, know their names, and show them interest. I know you cannot learn like 50 or 60 names in a day. Well, maybe some people will do, but uh, start with the interest of knowing that. Uh, and, and that takes the ability to really listen to simple things. Some, some students want to talk right away. Some others, they feel afraid and you have to give them their own space and take time little by little. So in between knowing them a little bit, having an informal conversation before the beginning of the class, then asking for their names, uh, and, and then having an activity to see how their reaction is amongst each other and towards the teacher, then you start to create a certain environment in which you will feel, and I think that's something uh, that, that, that teachers can be sensitive to, you have that feeling. When there's tension, when there's something wrong, when there's something going on, you feel that, that. 
And you can also feel when there's the right moment to get to ask certain questions. And that's when you get to start knowing your students as soon as possible. And you take the advantage of start to make a diagnosis, which would be another recommendation. First day of classes, uh, first week of classes, look for the opportunity to have a diagnosis about the students, about what, about what they know, about what they expect, about what they, uh, how they feel at that moment, and about uh, how they they intend, or, 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 or you can sense their attitude to start to be towards what is going to happen in this semester. So I think that would be pretty much the beginning of uh, of of a semester, and uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm I'm getting through the point which in which we have to match the academic work since the very beginning into a level in which you make a connection with the students. How personal? I leave that up to you, uh, to each of you. And uh, uh, I would just suggest to put up the educational objectives uh, always at sight and do not lose track of the educational objectives. But yes, I think we have to establish this connection. Part of, yeah, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it's a good point. You're really trying to know their names. I think uh, we can't, uh, you know, stress the importance enough of using their names, knowing their names as soon as possible call you and calling out their names in class. I think that really has a, a big impact. I think I would also add, uh, you mentioned a little bit about accessibility, like how you make yourself accessible. And I think at the very beginning of class, it's very important to articulate to the students how you plan to uh, be available uh, for right. them. So of course you're going to be available and they're in class to be able to answer questions, but you also as the instructor can uh, make decisions about whether or not you're going to be uh, available outside of class, maybe right. via email, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's even via video chat, very similar to this type of platform. It really just depends on, you know, uh, if you have office hours, right? If you're going to be available uh, in the office where they, they can come by and talk to you whatever that looks like. I think it's important to make those decisions before you begin class so right. that you talk with the students and say, okay, if you need extra help, these are the ways that you can uh, get that extra help, whether it's with me, whether it's external, whether there's a computer lab maybe that they you can give them some strategies about finding extra uh, help there. Um, but I, I think that that is also important to establish from the very beginning so that the students know that they have a support system uh, right. that maybe goes beyond the day-to-day -day, uh, classroom activities that they are participating in. So I just kind of throw that out there. And it's going to be different for everyone, of course, right. you know, what that looks like. But I think the point is that we uh, recognize what, how, you know, what kind of suggestions that we can make and how we can be accessible so that the students are getting the support that they need. Yes, I think we somehow we covered a couple of things about this uh, two shows ago in teacher learning cast number 17. And uh, and we discussed about WhatsApp use and, and we went through an article. You can go back to it and you can check the article. And indeed, they were talking about this, the extra support and the, the, the support that in this case, WhatsApp had with a certain group of students in a very what looks to be a very well organized and controlled study of a case. And, um, and, and yes, I agree with you that it's different to everyone. I'm gonna, I wanna share my experience. So, so uh, I don't know if this is something effective a hundred percent. I don't exactly know how students feel about it, but I can tell you that the effect so far has been uh, towards the positive side, towards the effective side. I established a Facebook group always, uh, which is for tutoring or for the classes I have. I have teaching workshop, uh, which is the name of a class, and I have a group for that. I have a group for tutoring in, in the other semester in these new new students. And uh, I, I'm always, uh, I do not set rules for making contact or or sending messages, et cetera, et cetera. What I do is that I establish the rules for the academic work. There are deadlines, there are moments in which they know they have to deliver, there are times, 
And then they start to, to ask for specifics. Like if I set a day for something, they ask me specifically for the hour. And then, the, and then we start to work from the rules, not for the contact and not for the communication, the rules for the academic work. Along the rules for the academic work, they are so far, most of them have been so polite to even ask you if they can send you a message. I mean, they text you and the first thing they do is, hello teacher, can I ask you a question about the class? And it's something natural. And, and I sometimes answer right away. Sometimes I'm busy, I cannot answer. Sometimes I get offline and I'm not online. Most of the time I'm online during the day. Sometimes I'm in a meeting or, or I'm at a party on weekends, on a Sunday, and I haven't had problems about the students who send messages and they don't get the answer right away. And I think that's a result of having a well-established package when you manage the academic work and you set the rules for the academic, each academic work that comes up. Uh, what I like the most is that all my alerts come in the mobile phone. Uh, I can, it's, I can read right away who's sending and the beginning, at least the beginning of the sentence they are making. If I have the opportunity, I read it. If I, if I don't have the opportunity, I don't. If I can answer, I try to answer. Sometimes I do not answer. And even for a day, I do not answer. And so far, I haven't had a problem about that. Students don't feel armed. They don't feel offended. You don't have to explain mo much. I don't know if this is a consequence of Work with, working with other teachers and teachers that strictly say, do not send me messages or do not look for me after classes or, or I don't know what is what happens, but they naturally catch this dynamic. And there's a moment in which they know I actually need some help. <clears throat> and they find a way to put it so clear that it makes you take the time to answer. Especially when, there, for example, in my case, when it's a tutoring thing, something about personal issues interfering and, and something that they, you, you can feel when they are really, really stressed about something and when, it's nice, when they need at least an answer, at least uh, don't worry about it, I'll contact you later, at least uh, no problem, we'll talk next class or think, simple things like those. So far, I think it hasn't been a problem. And when it gets weird is when I, when I just let things too open. When I just ask for something, for some academic work, that at the end it's too open, non-guided, no deadlines, no specifications, and they get lost. So I think if you have a well-planned, established academic work, and you have... Uh, uh, the availability to use social network in this case, it all fits little by little according to your rapport with the students, the establishment. And I go back to what I said before, earning the right to do things. I don't have to tell my students, uh, don't call me at this hour, don't do this, don't do that. They, they even feel the need to ask for permission. I would be, I, I mean, I, I don't want to show because it's a private thing, but I have list of, of uh, I have like, I can tell you, I don't know, like 50, 60 conversations which start with teacher. Could I please ask you something about the work? Could I, could I ask something about my next class? Uh, is it okay if I ask you something through here? Uh, I have a doubt about something. Is it okay if I if you if I ask you a question? I, I have like 50, 60 conversations like those starting in that. And I think the dynamic establishes by itself, but it all depends on the report you establish in class. And that starts the first day of class. How do they feel you? How do you feel them? Are you really showing this position? Saying it is one thing, but being available, being flexible, it's a different thing than just saying. What's your opinion on that? Thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, regardless if your experience with technology has been positive or negative as, a, as an instructor, whether you agree that technology should or should not be used, 
I think there's no denying that students, uh, the younger generation, they converse, they're used to conversing uh, by texting, by using mobile devices. That is their world. And it really is whether or not we as educators, whether or not we want to be a part of that, that world. Right. And, and, you know, when you say, you know, I find it interesting, Petey, when you're, you were sharing that some of your students were really, uh, you know, asking, oh, can I, you know, can I send you this? Can I ask you this question through this medium? What that tells me is that they've had prior experiences with educators who perhaps were not open right. or used <laughs> yeah. to using technology. I mean, that's, that's the first thing to come to mind. What, you know, because if they're not used to it, that that's based on their prior experiences with other uh -huh. teachers. Right. So um, it's like they're used to that world, but they're not used to uh, being in that world with their teachers. Right. And so I think that, again, this goes back to my point, you know, we need to decide, you know, are we going to use, you know, this means of communication or not, or, you know, and of course there, there are advantages and disadvantages, right? So there's challenges and it's going to depend on the maturity level and the age. And there's a lot of factors, of course, but we need to make some decisions and, and be fairly knowledgeable of the options that are ab available to us as educators with regard to technology so that we make the best decisions for our courses. You know, we had a great discussion some time ago. I think it was episode number five, if I'm not mistaken, with Ken Bauer. We talked about the flipped learning experience. And for me, this screams flipped learning, right? Whatever that looks like. What kind of flipped learning environment now can we create so that the the experiences with our students are are we get the most out of those experiences? So I think again, starting with the first day of class, that's when you establish these uh, parameters, these platforms, these uh, these ways of communicating, because it really is harder. And I've I've kind of uh, made this mistake in the past where you're midway through the semester and you try to change technology, you try to change the way that you're uh, kind of working, it is a challenge. So you're, you're, you're best off really trying to think, think it through before you begin so that first day of class you can really set the groundwork and, uh, and establish the, the, the framework and the platforms, as I mentioned, so that the students really understand what they're, they're getting themselves into from the very beginning. And you know, for me personally, I tend to use, although I try to streamline as much as possible, uh, I, I tend to use different forms of technology every every semester. And that first week or two is is an adjustment for the students, right? It's it's right. slow to start sometimes. And some, some students will gravitate to the technology faster than others. But I have found that after a couple of weeks and we start to get into a rhythm and a flow of, of classes and work and, and feedback and assessment throughout the process, uh, they see why we're using it, I think, because it, it, it really is for, for them to have a better learning experience and for me to be able to provide them the most timely uh, feedback uh, that best helps them throughout the course. Right, and just to complement that, uh... Yes, since it's the moment in which they take a little bit longer, maybe, or it may be one of the moments in which they take longer, it may be one of the moments in which they need you the most. But the comment in here is that, in my experience, uh, I don't know, maybe it's different with, with everybody else, but it, it always pays. If you invest time, if you dedicate this time, if you know this is the moment in which I'm going to dedicate a little bit more a little extra, I'm going to answer more messages, I'm going to have them more frequently at the office, it pays because soon, very soon in the semester, they start to catch up by themselves and do things by themselves and be loosened. If you see my records in tutoring, I have a, I, I, I tend to keep a record of every single tutoring I make during the semester, whether teachers, the students, or whomever comes to the office, that it's not officially in class hours. And I just write at least the name and the situation or the topic that we discuss. And what always happens is that at the beginning of the semester, I have the same day, a lot of people, a lot of people in which I'm answering online or I'm uh, talking to them at the office or in the halls and having these kind of conversations to support. 
And along the semester, it starts to diminish and diminish and diminish in such a way that there's a moment in which I forget about my list and I don't register anymore anything because there are days in which they are working by themselves, you see? And there are few few interaction in that sense because they are already on wheels. Towards the end of the semester, it charges again for the final papers or whatever assignments they have. But regularly, that's what happened. It pays well. It pays well when you invest some time at the beginning. Um, so just to wrap up all uh, these main aspects, because I have a couple of more that I will cover really very quickly. Um, uh, we've been discussing about knowing your students. I think all of this goes together. All of them go together, right? But we we talked about uh, knowing your students ASAP, uh, uh, how establishing the report in order to be able to know your students and then have the possibility to motivate them and uh, have this diagnosis, these reflections, ask questions and see where they are. I see you are very techy, Ben. I'm more in paper in those days. Uh, I have my first day quick reflections. I, I ask a couple of things to my students and they uh, sort of answer in, in paper. And, and they give and uh, they talk about their expectations. And yes, it's weird that some of them are not used to talking about their expectations. <laughs> But uh, if you find a couple of right questions after the proper motivation and the proper establishment of the feeling, they can give you uh, interesting things. It, it, was a, a, it was interesting to me that some of the things you mentioned about uh, uh, patience, the students asking for patience and they make those, that's exactly what they answer also this in this paper. So yes, we're talking about report, motivation, diagnosis, uh, reflection, the establishment of technology, and along that, we have the official aspects, the program to follow, the objectives to reach during the semester, the rules and the dynamic for the class, which I wouldn't detach from the other aspects. I'm kind of uh, against the idea of coming into the classroom, presenting a program for the sake of presenting a program and go through the official paper and read it while the students understand like this is something like a very i don't know this is a format to follow and we have to do it on the contrary if you kind of find a way to establish the report and motivate them to understand the the possibilities beyond the program beyond the paper beyond the written part meaning uh, making them feel and understand it's not about what it's not because it's written and because it's a rule it's because it's what is going to help you to develop skills knowledge and attitudes that will help you in your career in real life I, this is something i sometimes do there are topics that are flexible to mix. And when you talk about the academic aspect, you can also talk about life in general with students, especially when you talk about reflection, conflict, and things like those, and mostly in teachers, because that's what we live. We live every day in conflict. We need to reflect all, all of the time. So I think that's what I like the most, to make them understand that the program is not just the paper with a bunch of contents and exams and evaluations to fulfill that we are going to be working in certain dynamics during the semester that will lead them to greater self-awareness. I think that's the key. I think that's, that's the key. And whomever, uh, I think every class is different, and whomever finds a way to make students feel this in the first day of classes, to understand that it's something in the benefit, not because saying, oh, it's something that is good for you, but that they actually catch the passion to go through that semester in that topic, whether writing, whether uh, uh, teaching practice, whether linguistics, whether math, whether whatever topic it is, if you find a way to make students understand this uh, benefit of uh, having a major development and having a major self-awareness, I think you nailed it in the first days of classes. Yeah, I think it's important uh, to draw connections when you're looking at a BA program, especially in ours, you know, all of our courses are linked to other courses, whether horizontally or vertically, right? So uh, in the case of, of writing, uh, I 
try to show or explain to them that the course that they're taking with me is going to help them in other courses to see that they make the connection to the objectives of this current course and how it can help them in other courses. So mm -hmm. academically, you've got that connection. Mm -hmm. But I think more philosophically, for writing especially, I try also to have them realize that the, the process of writing really is a process of uh, individual um, work where some there others are getting to know them in, in a way that is not possible through spoken uh, discourse, right? Writing is really a creative process and you really get to know a person when you read what they write, right? So mm -hmm. I try to philosophically explain the really the for me anyway the joy of going through this process of creating something having someone read it and know more about me the writer right so that i try to project that onto my students so that they hopefully have at least an appreciation of this process of writing and really an opportunity to express themselves in a way that they can really uh cognitively think it through and 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 try to, if it's a persuasive essay or whatever type of essay it happens to be, but that they have uh, a, a voice and that they can create something for others to uh, to consume, right? So um, I think that, yeah, whatever course that you're teaching, it's a matter of trying to draw connections to not only maybe the academic side, but also the human side and, and how that uh, learning that content or learning those skills can really translate into uh, a different person, right? And and maybe even opportunities that maybe they didn't they don't um, think about or maybe they're not aware of initially as they begin a course. Right, and uh, and uh, what you're talking about it's really important. Um, uh, there is uh, a psychologist, I guess he's kind of a uh, uh, yeah, he, he's a psychologist that talks about different different aspects about my, the mind. And one of the things he mentioned, he's Mark Gongor, I guess. If you look for him in, in YouTube, you'll see very fun talks about uh, that from him. And he talks about putting a feeling into something, create a feeling, uh, make uh, the person to have the feeling. And then that's the moment of uh, teaching. See, if you put a feeling, the things uh, get sticked uh, more into, into their mind. So on that principle, uh, I, I would go through the idea of what do they want to read about? What do they want to write about? Uh, how do I connect my academic commitments? Because I have to fulfill certain things about my program. How do I connect those aspects to what they actually want? Because I go back to my idea of gaining the right. How do I gain, gain the right for students to be willing to design material, for example? If I'm asking them constantly, create this material, do this and do it like that, or it has to be bigger, it has to be, but I've never asked them what kind of materials do they actually like, not only using, but doing, creating. What kind of things they actually like uh, when they sit down and start creating uh, maybe it's a, it's for some of them it's going to be written material. For some of them it's going to be worksheets and handouts to deliver. For some of them it's going to be no crafts or things done with my hands. I had a student last semester who would always invest hours, hours designing his material because he 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 did even models to bring to the classroom for a class. So my task there was to encourage him to find better ways to exploit that because he invested to a, a lot of time. And I think these kind of things are the ones that enrich more. So if you gain the right through making a student aware that what they actually care about and making them, well, not making them, not, not just telling them, but going with them along to find the path to connect my academic content to whatever they actually are really interested in. I recall right now the videos about physics, the classes of physics where, where teachers come with experiments and they, in secondary school, and they have really fun experiments when things uh, explode or, or uh, I don't know, gas colors and things come up and the students are really engaged. I think it can be the same thing for every single class. Just uh, look for the way to relate it. I'm talking about my case 
Uh, lesson planning and material. All right, how do you plan? Do, would you prefer to write it? Would you prefer to record it and then listen to it and transcribe it? Or would you prefer to uh, put it into cards? Put it into cards. Do you prefer to bring it into uh, a list of things to do and paste it on the wall? I mean, choose whatever fits to you, what you feel comfortable with. And I think it applies for most classes, right? Even uh, I always say about math, because in Mexico, I don't, I don't know in other countries, but in Mexico, math, there's, there's a big, um, uh, I think in, in, in my point of view, there's a wide number of people that in certain generation got frustrated with math classes because of the dynamics that were, uh, that were used before. Now, I think those classes can be interesting if you find a way to make it interesting. I mean, I can talk and talk about this. Just in the morning, I heard a guy on TV. Uh, it, it, this was a, uh, uh, bio, uh, it was a chemistry, chemistry program. And the first thing he was doing in his bumper for the, for the program was saying things that would catch your attention. Like he was talking about the, the, hair, the, the hairspray you are using right now. The, the soda that you drank yesterday with the meal. And, and he started to mention a couple of things that some, somehow catch your attention. And then at a certain moment, he said, that's chemistry. And today we will discuss about chemistry in this. And somehow he got your attention. I think it's the same for every subject. And that can be established since the very beginning of the semester of the year. Yeah, I think uh, the emotional aspect of learning cannot be understated. I think, uh, you know, it's very important to really look at both of the social and emotional aspects of learning. I came across a website called Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, mm -hmm. CASEL, C-A-S-E-L. If you go online, you can find their webpage, C-A-S-E-L.org, and uh, they have five core competencies that, are, that relate to social and emotional learning that I think really are... Uh, useful in this discussion. So if you're you know, watching this broadcast, if you're watching the recording, double, you know, definitely d d check this website out, castle, C-A-S-E-L dot org, and check out the four competencies. They list the five as being self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, res uh, relationship skills, and social awareness. So uh, check it out. I think this is really in line with what you're saying, PD, about really trying to find the connections, but the, the emotional connection, uh, because we're emotional human beings, right? And we have feelings. And I think when we can combine the emotional aspect uh, to the educative experience, uh, you, you're, they're going to get more out of the, the learning process for sure. So double check that uh, website. I think that'll be uh, useful and very much relevant to what you're saying, Petey, this important aspect of uh, emotional learning and really not forgetting, you know, that our students, you know, they're, they're, they have feelings, they have perspectives, they have backgrounds. And as, as, as in tune as we can be to those, uh, those aspects, uh, the better. Right. And then uh, another aspect would be exactly the setting of the way you're going to work in the dynamic and the technology, of course, which uh, I don't know if any of you want to invest time in that today. You want to wait for next show or... Uh, uh, as you feel better, as as to uh, not to leave things in the air, and I mean, uh, because the idea was to um, uh, close all this beginning of the semester towards the idea also of presenting the dynamic on technology. So yeah, maybe another day I can go into detail. I would like to share kind of uh, in greater detail the technologies that I'm going to use this semester because they're quite different than what I've done in the past. Um, but I will say that. Uh, I agree with you that technology is really a key aspect because it really should facilitate or promote this emotional learning that we're talking about. It's not really looking at technology in isolation, as we've talked a lot about in the past. It's really looking at the tools that are available and really making those decisions that help us promote the type of uh, you know environment that we want for our students, the type of learning environment where they're able to express their expectations and really getting to learn uh, and know each other and really trying to set the stage from the very beginning. You know, if you, you need to make those decisions, I feel about technology, 
really from day one. Because again, if you're making adjustments uh, throughout the uh, semester as far as different technologies, it can be uh, a challenge uh, for the, the learners, right? So, and that's sometimes hard to do because, you know, I, talking from experience, you know, I've, I've been halfway through a semester and realized, well, maybe this technology I'm using this semester is not the best option. Maybe this is not the best way to do it. And even though I, you know, my gut tells me, wow, I should change, right? It's almost like, well, maybe I'll wait it out, make the best of it, and then try again next semester. But um, this, it is a learning process, both for the learners and for the uh, educator. I think it's important that instructors uh, are really ref reflective practitioners, right? So that they are reflecting on what's working in the classroom and what's not, and you know, making those decisions appro accordingly. But yeah, I mean, I'll leave that to another day. I, I do want to throw out very quickly, though, the importance of trying to learn um, about students' backgrounds starting from day one, just to kind of throw this out there. Um, okay. Try to find ways to learn about their prior experiences, right? Maybe it's a matter of finding out, you know, have their past experiences been positive with English, right, in our case, or, right. or, or negative. And as much as they're willing to share their experiences about what worked for them in the past and what, what didn't, without mentioning, of course, teachers' names and all the specifics, right, it's not going to turn into a, you know, a gossip uh, thing. But the, the right. point here is just for them to at least have the opportunity to share their experiences. And in my case, and in, in the case of writing, I always invite them to share with me any prior writings or prior essays that they've created in the past. Right. Because again, it just gives me further perspective from the very beginning, from day one, uh, as to how to plan for future classes. So think to yourself really about how your particular class um, you know, what would be the best way to get that information of past experiences, maybe mm -hmm. past educational products that they have created, so that, again, from day one, uh, this process of learning more about the students, it really just adds to the, to the other uh, types of information that really gives you a broader perspective on who they are and what they need and want out of your class. Right. This this comes from the principles for teaching. Uh, I think it's Osbel who mentions that uh, uh, you have to build from students' prior knowledge, prior uh, things, so so they feel engaged. So whatever they've done before, academically or non-academically, talking about the context and the background, um, it can also influence in the way it's uh, in 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 the way in the easiness for them to catch up with new things. And the new challenges. Uh, I think uh, I would like to wrap up all of this idea of the first days of classes and the first uh, encounter with the students and establishing things, making the connection with uh, something that I consider really important. It's not about telling them what's going to happen. It's not about saying what the rules are. It's not about uh, telling them, oh, do it, we are going to be greater and you're going to be greater at the end of the semester. And it's, about it's not about telling. It's about doing the things, making students aware that you're actually doing the things and committed to their development. Example, picture this. Imagine a class uh, in which... You, uh, you have uh, an hour class, two hour classes is the first day of class and you come to the classroom 15 minutes late. You are late for the class and then you start setting the technology at the moment you start 15 minutes later. You start to open the documents you may use, which is going to be maybe the program or whatever you want, them, or the rules of the classroom, whatever you want. And then after 15 minutes, you start setting technology. So class starts 20 minutes later. And then you start and go through the rules and you tell them the rules. And uh, just to include the students, you ask them, do you want to add another rule? And that's it. Uh, but they don't have a clue what to add. And then that's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>
And that's exactly what you did the first day of class. It don't matter. It doesn't matter how much you're going to tell them, how much you try to encourage them by cheering them up, by motivation of things, or by having a nice voice, or trying to establish a rapport through the way you speak. It's about what you do. I think maybe, I don't know if consciously or unconsciously, but the students know it's going to be a class in which the, the minor opportunity for not having class is going to be taken. The minor opportunity to enlarge moments just to spend some time in there, it's going to be taken. So students start doing the same. I think if you come the first day of class with the attitude and dynamics you want them to have, what do you want them to do? In your, do you want them to participate in class? Well, come with something that makes them participate during that first day of class. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right on. I think that one of the aspects of writing uh, a novel is to show, not tell. And I think that when you're teaching, um, showing what the the benefits are of of learning the objectives for the class instead of telling them, showing the be types of behaviors that you want instead of telling the beha what behaviors you expect, but showing them through modeling throughout the throughout the, the the educative experience I think that really has more of an impact and I think it relates a lot to what you mentioned PD before about emotional learning but show not tell and if we take that philosophy as educators I think uh, we're going to be better off um, because they're they're going to be seeing and literally living that experience and seeing why what they're doing has a purpose right has a reason for a rationale for doing it so it involves you to get really prepared for those first days, to get really prepared with the best you got. I think that's I think that's one of the things. Well, obviously the idea is do your best every single day of the semester, but think about the first class or the first week of classes like your sample classes. Prepare with your best. That would be the first one. Second, gain the right as soon as possible. Make a connection and establish, open yourself to students in a way that they understand that you are willing to do something for them. That you are not only there to work and show something like teaching, like give them some information. No, I'm here to help you develop, gain the right. Then after gaining that right, now make a diagnosis, ask. See, see how they feel. Ask something about them because if you gain the right, they are going to share more with you. You're going to know them better in that way. And at all moments, do. Do, by example. What do you expect them to do? Start doing it from the first moment of class. Do you want them, it's an English class, do you want them to speak, to participate? Have them speaking the first day of class. Don't let them just listen to you. Do you want them to, uh, I don't know, in my case, for example, do I want them to design certain, um, to be careful about certain aspects in lesson planning or in the design of material? Well, I bring material so they can see it and they can see models. Uh, and I don't have to tell them, oh, this is the model that I want you to see. No, I just use it for my class and they say it. I want them to use certain techniques. I adopt those techniques. And I use those techniques since the very first day. I've always talked about different techniques. Um, and right now I'm fond of Russia's model, Russia's ideas and power teaching because I've always talked about them but never used them. I've been using them for more than a year now. And I think I started to change some things and adapt them to my own style in my own way. And I have students who are with me again, and they even told me one student, uh, when I made this comment with, with other teachers, the student was there and she told me, yes, I can see that. Because I can see the difference from one year ago when you try to do that, and I can see how you do it now, and I see work. So doing it, make students pretty much have a preview of what uh, all, all also can do, right? And more than you doing it, if you do it and you make them join you doing the things you want to do and let them put their own part, like, what do you want to do? 
What do you like the most? For example, in, in, I don't know, maybe in your class, are they going to write? What do you want to write about? Go ahead. Write about whatever you want. Just, uh, okay, let's cover certain things. The same thing over here. Create the material you want. Just what do you like the most? Do you like uh, Playmat? Do you like kids stuff? Do you like toys? Do you like, or do you like professional things? Do you like plots? Do you like banners? Do you like, come on, go ahead. Show me your best. Do you like draw? I have very good drawers in, in the classroom. Come on, go ahead and draw something. And let's work from that. And then you make copies and you deliver the copies and then we work on that. So you don't spend that much time making one drawing for each student. But things like those, I think that wraps it up. More than telling, do it. And have a student, and not just you doing it, have a students doing it along with you since the very first moment of class. Prepare yourself, gain the right, diagnose the students and involve them doing the things. Yeah, and to put a fine point on this, the first day, differentiate, explain how you're going to differentiate uh, the class. Differentiating in the sense of content, as PD is talking about, and how giving them authority and uh, the right to really choose what kind of content they can use. How are you going to differentiate process? So what kind of flexibility are you going to have in the learning process that the students are going to be able to actively uh, make decisions about? How are you going to differentiate products? So what types of different products can students expect to create for throughout that, that semester or that course? And finally, how can you differentiate maybe even the learning environment so you can actually give them choices and say, okay, this class for this semester, you're going to have different ways of accessing and, and participating in the course. Maybe some of it's using technology, maybe some of it's not. But make decisions from the very beginning and establish that level of differentiation in terms of content, process, product, and learning environment. And if you can do that and then you follow through with that, I think uh, the students are going to be more engaged instead of maybe just kind of, you know, not making that as explicit as possible. So I think differentiation, it really is uh, in line with what, uh, what you're saying, PD. I, I totally agree with that. And again, it's going to look different for, for everyone, but, yeah. but the idea is to consider some level of differentiation and uh, make the, try to make the best decisions from the very first day of class. Oh, Ben, I have a question here from one of our viewers, and I think it's a really important one. I'm going to risk it because it's a very serious question. To, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I want to first, uh, as a first comment, to clarify that everything we're saying here is our opinion and it's our point of view according to our experiences. This is a question from Rocio Rangel. And, uh, well, she greets us. So, hi, Ben, from Rocio. Hello. And she asks, how can we solve that creativity is affected because the teacher does not know how to keep its personal feelings, its personal, or his, her personal life apart? And she's talking about the moment of planning. How can you put aside personal things like feelings or a bad moment? For example, some days the teacher does not, and she even explains that. Some, some uh, days I'm not creative because I'm living the worst day of my life, maybe. That like, just like an example, right? And I have to plan my classes. I don't know if you want to take a shot or uh, want me to take a shot at it. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll throw out something, and then I'm curious, Petey, what, uh, what your thoughts are. Um, I think that the first thing that comes to mind, because I think we can all relate, you know, some days are better than others. We are human beings as teachers, so there are going to be days where we have to put on a, you know, the smiling face and be positive, and when maybe, you know, there are some things in our personal life that are a are, are struggle or a challenge. And so I think the first thing for me, at least, that I try to do is I try to focus on the students in the sense that their, the class, the learning experience is about them. It's not okay. about me. Yeah. What's most important is not what I do as the teacher. It's what they do. And I try to, you know, force that and I try to remember that every single day. It's not about what I do. It's about what my students do. Now, of course, I have some influence probably, you know, I'm, I'm going to control the learning environment, mm -hmm. but try to keep that in mind and, and try to separate and realize that when you're there with them, you know, they don't know what you're going through and they don't know, you know, the struggles that you're going through. 
and we have to maintain a level of professionalism, right? Even though that we're, you know, um, you know, we're having a bad day, we still have to do our job. And so I think the thing that I try to do is if there are days that I'm, you know, something's going on and I'm just either emotionally not there or something or, or what, for whatever reason, I try to think about uh, 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 some sort of experience that they can do or some sort of activity that they can do that maybe I'm less involved or more involved. It depends on, on the situation, but it's really not, um, it's, it's really trying to be flexible enough and have enough ideas in your mind about in your and in your planning about what types of activities or alternative activities that you can implement right. even maybe on the fly you know it's i think it's good to have a couple of you know i would i call these throwaway activities or kind of activities that are kind of in reserve for emergency purposes where you think okay if worst case scenario you know if technology dies or if something happens or if i can't perform the, the way that i want to perform I can do these certain types of activities and and they're kind of standby so that you can use those and and on those those days that maybe you don't feel up to doing you know a certain type of task but um, I think it's going to be highly individualized and very personal to the 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 teacher I think some people obviously can handle stress different they handle stress different than others and 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 they don't feel cr creative and and sometimes uh, your belief that you're not creative is totally different than what the students think. So yeah. the first thing I would ask you is you may feel like crap. You may feel horrible. You may feel like you have no creative juices at all. And the students could feel completely different. So uh, I, I would first ask that you make sure that you're in tune enough with the students and that you're reaching out to the students and so that you know what they are, uh, what what they like, what they if they are engaged, and because our ex our perspective of what they think oftentimes can be very different than the reality, right? So uh, right. you know, a couple of things there that I would think about uh, whenever you know you're you're feeling a little bit challenged as far as you know how creative do I think I am as a teacher? Yeah, right. Uh, I think it's got to do a lot with the stress thing somehow. And whatever is coming to your mind, it's always going to affect the way you act in every second. The first thing I, I would say about this, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, keep focus. Uh, keep focus. In this case, you're mentioning keep focus on the students at learning and learning activities and dynamic and development. It's focus on the students themselves, the student center and non teacher now, she was mentioning that she's got this issue with, uh, or she may have this issue when planning. When you don't, that, that in the moment of planning, things don't come to your mind because you are too worried about other things or certain kind of stress about other things. Uh, well, the first thing is that that's a job. We need to start learning to cope with it. And the question would be, how do you cope with it? I can't, It came to my mind, one of the uh, uh, talks I follow, uh, 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 a Hindu guy that his name is Gaur Gopal Das, and he talks about uh, living the moment, the interpretation and living the mo of living the moment, and he makes it clear the difference between uh, the wrong connotation of don't worry about tomorrow, do what you are now because you are enjoying, and there tomorrow you may die. No, that's not his connotation of living the moment. Living the moment is. Uh, what you just mentioned about focusing. Uh, do one thing at a time. One thing at a time. And do it consciously. I'm writing, I'm sitting here to, and this is the, the way he puts it. I'm gonna, he, he gives an example about eating, right? I'm sitting here because I'm gonna eat. And I have in my plate, I have this foot. And I can go through this. I like this better. I'm gonna go through this better. Or I like combining food. I go through it combined. I put it into planning terms in the way that I'm here to plan and I have to plan. So all I start to focus the, on the idea that all my senses are into planning. What do I need in order to plan? And one of the things that what you just said, I need to focus on my students. I need to know, uh, and, and, and you can start rephrasing your mind. That's what I would uh, try to do. 
and and then next time I'll do it because I've been there too and I'm surely I will be there in the stress when planning think about all right who am I teaching even though you know it's first semester or second semester or level one or level two you can kind of think okay who am I teaching I'm teaching first semester and first semester is I don't know this guy Juanito Juanita and Lucia and and Pedro and start focusing what's the topic of the day and then you have your uh, prior formats like the syllabus or your scheme of work or the class before or the book and start focusing on the moment and that's the way he puts it like live for the moment put all your senses in the moment and start focusing because whatever is stressing you whether it's going to go away or it's not <laughs> But if you keep focus, you can uh, have your mind into that and start feeling that moment with the thoughts related to what you are doing. I think that may help you a little bit. And I think that's something I would recommend you to do, even though if it is not the worst day of your life or you're not stressed, you need to sit down and consider this is the moment of planning. So turn off the TV and, uh, and start thinking about first my students the topic, the objectives, the context I'm going to bring and start putting things together. And little by little, you will see how ideas and creativity come for themselves. Because in this case, uh, Rocio is one of our students at the BA and she is at a BA level because she's got already certain skills developed from prior education. And she is, I think she's a third semester student. So she's been through first, second semester. She's already passed certain subjects which have come to get her into a level in which she's got certain skills so it's just a matter of focus in that sense it's difficult yes how do you do it one thing at a time one yeah. thought at a time yeah and i think it depends too if you're really stressed out about the planning process or if you're or their external stressors right. Like personal mm -hmm. right your personal life right. um i did i didn't really focus my response on the planning but i would just add and I agree with what you're saying there, PD. I would add that the planning, uh, try to find logical blocks of, of planning. Like what I mean by that for, in my case, I have students, I teach students five, one hour a week for, for, uh, uh, for five hours a week. And I try, to, I try to frame each block as a week. Mm -hmm. So I try to plan activities that are in a, succession that is one goes right after another and monday through friday so monday through friday is kind of a series of activities that have kind of a weak objective so if it helps in your planning to to kind of break down the planning to into blocks so that each activity or each day is not like an isolated experience uh, for me that has helped a lot right and it depends i know if you're taking a course uh a teaching practicum course that may be more actually more difficult uh, to do depending on the situation. But, you know, try to think in terms of, you know, activities uh, enabling other activities in some sort of not necessarily a task based pr approach, although it, it could be, but but just a, a, a series of events that kind of maybe go from the simple activities to more complex over time. And and so that you kind of see like a, a flow of of activities so that it has it makes sense because I, for me personally if i had to come up with activities that were totally isolated actually for me that's more of a challenge that's harder to do uh, especially just thinking like a general english course uh, every day just a different type of activity with no kind of a broader uh, vision of where i'm going for me it makes it more difficult and it, that would cause stress in my life trying to do it that way so I would just throw that out there as well. Kind of think of your planning as some sort of uh, kind of a, a, a map, right? Or kind of a, a series of experiences that lead to some greater performance. All right. I think we got a lot of time today, <laughs> but uh, I didn't want to leave this question aside because uh, uh, I, I thought it was something really important and relevant because uh, we, we discussed today about the beginning of a semester, how to set the things. And yes, planning is always 
the basics, whether a minute before or a month before or a year before, whether the plan changed or it doesn't change or whatever, it's the key. Teaching, it's all about planning, doing, and reflecting. Right. Uh, we want to really thank everyone to watch, and we th re really appreciate, Rocio, your question, and we encourage everyone to post your questions. Really, this is – we would much rather field questions and, and address your questions, so feel free to, even in mid-broadcast, to submit your questions either live during the broadcast or, of course, throughout the week. You can uh, post your questions in Facebook. We're under Teacher Learning Cast. We have a dedicated page preci precisely for – for uh, teachers to leave comments, share their experiences, and of course, reach out to us if you ever want to be a part of the live broadcast. So, uh, I, Pity, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences. Yeah, sorry, Ben. I, I just wanted to thank also all the people that joined us today. Yolanda Morales that is still watching us, Miriam, Jasmine, that is around, Claudia, Tania, Veronica Duron, Daniel Flor, uh, Carla, Luis de la Fuente, Nid. Pao, Nayali, uh, Maritza, uh, Jesus Miguel, Rogelio, Jesus Enrique, Chito, Hector that joined us earlier in the transmission and many others that are around and I cannot scroll down to see them back, but uh, sorry if I'm not mentioning you and you're watching, uh, but thank you for watching. Thank you, Rocio, for the question and uh, we'll see you here. We'll try to keep on doing it every Saturday morning, 8.15 Teacher Learning Cast, discussing issues related to teaching and learning. Great. I think this will conclude our broadcast. Thanks, Petey. Thanks, everyone, again, for watching. Thanks to those who are watching the recordings as well. And we'll see everyone in the next broadcast. Keep on learning.